Exodus 18, 16 is where we're going to begin today. The Lord said to Moses, really then the Lord said to Moses, um, the word then, uh, uh, trans when you're translating Hebrew, then isn't really a word that you come across. There isn't a direct one-to-one -one correlation between the uh, what, what is in Hebrew and a word in English like then because it's really just the generic conjunction which normally we would either translate and or but but sometimes it's definitely connected to the previous so that that's that's when you use a word like and in translation but there's a little bit of of uh, of of of, of, of give here, a little bit of wiggle room. Not like that middle long table that wiggles constantly that Myron and, and the crew are sitting at, but um, a little bit of wiggle room. But in, in another translation, it might say and here as opposed to then. I just want you to understand the difference. It's, it's just, uh, it's a single stroke of a pen. It's the letter Vav. And does it get translated with and or therefore or then? or next or something like that. And it's uh, the translator uh, trying to convey what is logically the most likely here. And sometimes influenced by other translations, by, by what they said and so forth. Anyway, that's where the then comes from. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become. And the question here is, what does this word mean? So this says gnats. Uh, any of you in, a, in, a, in, in, in previous teaching experience come across another translation here besides gnats? Flies is the next plague. <laughs> Mosquitoes. The, the Jews say lice. Here, I like the I like lice as a translation. Here, uh, I don't like lice at all. Uh, I remember walking into my sister-in-law's house one 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 year when we drove the 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 um, five hundred miles down to where my sister-in-law lived. The moment my family walked in the house, she said, "Take off all your clothes, put them in these bags, and go take showers." because her daughter had just come home from school with lice. And so that's what we got to do for the rest of the, of the trip was bag all of the toys in the house and, and sit there and in our underwear and stare at each other. And, and, uh, uh, but I remember just being really, really tired um, and, and helping out at the house then. But lice are... Um, have, have most of us been through lice at least once at home? Um, something like that. We went through it a couple times, and and uh, mostly because it was a classmate and not our kid. But it got you know the the whole group has to do something about it. Have any of you seen Schindler's List? Yes. Do you remember the lice incident in Schindler's List? They're talking, and uh, I suppose is it is it F. Marie Abraham? Is he the guy who plays the main uh, Jewish prisoner? who types the list for Schindler. You remember that? Is that the right guy? But he, as he's talking, he keeps scratching his head. And he, and he, and he says, are you all right? And he says, oh, we scratch our heads so the Nazis will think we have lice. Then they'll stay away from us. So, you know, they didn't have lice, but, you know, it's a way to keep people away from you. So interesting incident there. But So the dust of the ground and... Gnats, I suppose, lice, whatever they are. And all the dust throughout the land became these gnats. So I worked hard on that slide. So you don't have to applaud, but I worked hard on it. All right. And now, now here's where Luther spends pages talking about this verse. When the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. And the gnats were on men and animals. So that if whatever they were, the mosquitoes or chiggers or lice or whatever they were, they they the magicians, the, the, the Egyptians couldn't do this. Um, they could turn the water into blood. 
They could bring frogs seemingly out of nowhere, but what eludes them? Little bitty lice. They can't do it. And, and, and how this glorifies God, that the devil is unable to do what God can do with the littlest of things. Go ahead. It's always permission when the devil is able to do something. There's always an element of permission. And there's a verse in, oh, forgive me, is it 2 Corinthians, which I haven't read for a couple of months. Um, there is a, a verse about God al basically allowing the devil so much room to give himself glory. He will permit these things. Um, there's an old expression in English, he gives him enough rope to hang himself you know that that the devil can do some of it and why not just prevent all of it well we wouldn't look to God anymore if if we never experienced trouble if he was always rushing in if God stood outside our door like Matt Dillon constantly and never let a bad guy get anywhere near us what would what would happen and so God allows some of these smaller troubles that's why last time I was I was kind of introducing those other plagues with the Lord essentially saying, okay, I got one for you, but it's an easy one. Maybe you can do this one. Blood, right? And they're, they're able to do that. And then the Lord comes out with, I got another one. The, you, you, pray, you guys can probably do this too, but let's do frogs and the, the frog. But now the lice come, these gnats, and they can't do it. And the magicians are going to talk to Pharaoh about it in another verse, but, but they're unable to do even this little thing and because the devil cannot make. He cannot create. He can only pervert. So the devil can destroy what God does, but he can't come up with anything new. The devil cannot raise a person from the dead. The devil cannot take uh, uh, an elderly woman who is barren and widowed and, uh, and suddenly give her miraculously a family. But God can do that kind of stuff. God can take uh, 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 somebody who is downtrodden and abused and afflicted and raise that person up to being the most important individual in all of Egypt. You know, he did that earlier, 400 years ago, with Joseph. Um, and now God allows Aaron to bring these gnats out, out of the ground by just smacking the ground with his, with his stick. And the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Egyptian magicians just, just can't do it. But what do they say? The magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So... What do they mean by the finger of God? God has no fingers, of course, right? Um, but when God accomplishes something, the, the, the biblical writers do talk this way. What, what is the finger of God? It's the Holy Spirit who does things, just as our fingers do things. Um, Luther has a graphic des description here. A man who has had all of his fingers cut off can't do a lot of things, right? And uh, makes you wonder about their culture and so forth. But yeah, uh, but they had wars with edged weapons. You know, we don't have that. But they would have guys come back from the war and he's got a hand with no fingers. So I think anthrax would be the scariest. I think, is it Larry, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah anthrax. I, I, I agree. It's, it's, and it's, and for, for your farm animals, it's, it's just terrifying. It's, there are other things, hoof and mouth, there are other things that are, that are scary, but anthrax is, is uh, whatever this was. And it could have been a miraculous plague that was unique to Egypt. That's always a possibility. But um, it would have been, this would have been uh, very nasty. Um, I have uh, uh, something called uh, rinder pest. Chrysipolis, foot and mouth, anthrax, or streptococcus. Uh, streptococcus, I'm, sh I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I got those from a commentary that different, but all of those are possibilities here. But the thing about your animals and, and disease is that for people who work with animals, who own, whose 
Investment is in their animals. That's everything to that family. If the animal gets sick, what are you going to do? You, and if an animal is diseased also, you can't eat it. Right? There's not much you can do with it. Because really, to stop the disease, you don't even get to benefit from saving like the hide. You've got to burn it. Right? So m most likely, you can't do anything with this critter. So, and it, it's just heartbreaking. So, the plague on livestock. And they also worship those animals. So the Egyptians, yeah, yeah. So, God kills their gods. I was going to mention this. Thank you for bringing that up. I was thinking about this last night as I was studying. Uh, Moses doesn't mention the names of the Egyptian gods. Have you noticed that? We talked about this last time. We, there, there, there have been people like Adersheim who have tried to equate each of the plagues as an attack against a particular Egyptian god or a group of Egyptian gods so that God kind of undoes all of the Egyptian gods. And that might be a worthwhile study for somebody, but shouldn't we also notice that Moses doesn't do that? That Moses won't or doesn't you know what what word should i be using here why does moses not tell us the names of the egyptian gods well what's the first commandment do not have any other gods at all and moses won't even let them come out of his lips he will sometimes talk about the gods of the amorites the gods of the moabites and so forth but it's the, the prophets will talk about their names. You know, Isaiah and Jeremiah don't have a problem with mentioning Chemosh or, 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 or the Baals and things like that. But Mo, and, and if, if somebody Moses is writing about, like um, uh, Naaman the Syrian, if he mentions gods by names, but Moses himself, especially here in the plagues, will not mention the Egyptian gods. I wonder if Moses, who is so careful about what he writes, if he wants the names of those gods to just die. You know, why, why, should, we, why should we bother with all of these? Let them, let them just die. Um, there might be some wonderful profound wisdom there it's not wrong to talk about heresy we have to sometimes um, Paul does it in the New Testament John certainly does it in the New Testament Peter James and Jude do it in the New Testament um, Jesus does it he'll talk about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees right he'll talk about their false doctrine but there comes a point where you don't want to describe the false doctrine too carefully because people being people, you don't want people to remember the false doctrine and think that that was correct doctrine. So there's that problem with probing into, it's, it's one thing that I, it bothered me about some of my college classes, was having to probe too deeply into other religions and denominations and having, why do we have to study the Mormons so intensely? You know, and, 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 and write papers about them on, on all of this. And, uh, but, then, but then you meet them and you realize we have to make sure that our people don't fall into this. One of the first men I ever met in New Ulm was a Jehovah's Witness. And he wanted to talk with me about Jesus. And I, uh, I said, sure. And we, 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 we talked together and I ended up uh, meeting with him on a pretty regular basis. We ended up meeting about twice a month. And I met with him actually over in the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall, which is how I found out that they have windows. It's just kind of a myth about Kingdom Halls and about ours in particular. Um, and the, his story was this. He had belonged to a Lutheran church here in New Ulm, not of our fellowship, but a different Lutheran. I, I think it was our saviors, but I'm not sure. 
And he told me that he had asked, when he was in his days as a Lutheran, he had been a, a part of the leadership of his congregation and asked his pastor, could you start teaching Bible classes? And the pastor's response was, it's always so much work and nobody ever comes. It doesn't do anybody any good. And this went on for a couple of years where he kept begging the pastor, can you please... I'll buy materials. You just have to lead the class. I'll make the coffee. I'll get the room ready. Please, can we have a Bible study? And the pastor, the, the, the pastor there just kept refusing. And one day after one of these refusals, ding dong, the Jehovah's Witnesses show up at his door and say, we'd like to study the Bible with you. And he, he, he took it almost as a sign they want to do it, my pastor won't do it, so I'll, I'll go there. And what happened? His, his, his whole family, the whole kit and caboodle, they all became members of the, of the local Jehovah's Witnesses, and he became one of their um, most aggressive um, outreach guys, knocking on doors and talking to people. And he and I decided to read the Gospel of Mark together. We, I sat down with him week after week after week. It was about an hour every Thursday or Friday for, for weeks on end. We carefully went through the Gospel of Mark. He had some kind of smattering of beginner's Greek, as a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses do. And if I would try to correct him, he wouldn't believe me. You know, well, you've only had eight years of Greek, but I've had eight days, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and, uh, and I, I say that kind of flippantly, but that's kind of the attitude that you that you find um, and uh, he would not and I, I found that a lot of his theology was still kind of leftover Lutheran and so that's my hope for him my prayer for him that that whatever's there will still kind of stick with him but um, to sometimes it helps to learn about these other religions because it helps you do some evangelism. Talk to Norma Schmidt about her work among the Mormons. You know, when they were, they were doing the, camp, the big campaign, are you feeling worthy? Because that's the big Mormon sense, is you have to feel worthy. And of course, we're not worthy. Um, so learning about that helps, can, can help to, to, to make an inroad there and so forth. But there, I could go on and on about this kind of thing, but, but um, but I just wanted to point out that Moses doesn't mention the, the gods of Egypt. And it might be worth uh, studying, but, but Moses doesn't. So, let my people go so they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock in the field, on your horses, donkeys, and camels, and on your sheep, I'm sorry, on your cattle, sheep, and goats. Six, right? A definite list here. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt, so that no animal belonging to the Israelites will die. Um, we don't have a record of this, but I, I wondered a little bit, is that the naughty boy? If an Israelite had lent an animal to an Egyptian, would all the other ones die and not the one that was just on loan or something like that? And I suppose that's true. But I wanted to just run through quickly here the likely uses for these animals. For a horse, horses were used mainly for what in Egypt in this time? Chariots, Chariots mostly for pulling in, in a military sense. Horses are for speed and strength. So military use. Donkeys is mostly for, well, I'll call it business transportation. Um, Camels, more for distant trade because they have the longevity to get through things. Cattle are for milk and for the best food of all. Although I'm, I'm, the, the Egyptians and the, and the people of India have different religions, and I'm not sure about Egypt and beef. Um, but I, it, it doesn't make, maybe make a, make a big difference. Sheep are a better food, but not the best food. And goat... Uh, the poorer food, and, but hardier. Um, goats also sometimes used as a poor man's transport. Um, a goat cart. 
could pull things around, uh, you know, your little red wagon or what have you. So what areas of Egyptian life would be affected by allowing harm to come to these animals? Commerce. Almost everything, yeah. Commerce, the military, the, the homes, the farms, um, in town, almost everything. And, all, and also, yeah, yeah their, 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 their food stocks and things like that. The Lord set a time and said, tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. So that how, how this was possible that the Israelites animals did not perish I mean they were in Goshen so they're separated by a branch of the river but this is the hand of God isn't it as the Egyptians said the finger of God Where did Pharaoh get horses for the chariots? <coughs> later on yeah. yeah that's a good question um, however he's the wealthiest man in the world so probably probably trade and it's possible that this was afflict, aff, afflicting things that are basically in the Nile and that upriver down south he had stores of animals like horses that were not affected by this and later on the Egyptians are able to pull out some animals even though we had this one so um, is there a did they do they have an influx of animals that they were able to get them or we're not that's not really explained and I'm willing to let that just sit there so did I see a hand? No. Well, you just have put in there that all the animals died, all those who contact the disease died. But isn't that the same thing? All the animals died? Probably. But they all have yeah. The yeah. Yes? Just another one. Couldn't they have gone out and stolen animals from other places? Oh, that, well, there's always a sinful answer to everything. So yeah, they could have they could have stolen, they could have uh, uh, conscripted. Um, what is it? What what do you call it when 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 Napoleon walks through the town and 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 takes all your all your horses? He um, confiscates or whatever. He, yeah, something like that. Conscripted is a word that I would have used. What would have happened to Israel as a nation if God had allowed all their animals to have died in Egypt? I suppose he would have found them animals from somewhere else. Go to Midian and trade some of the gold that you've gotten or whatever that could have happened. Did Israel bring their sheep and goats along on the, on the Exodus? The answer is yeah, they did. They did. We'll be told that later on. Um, the flocks went with them. We have, uh, in, in, not, in the not too distant future, God will say, take your flocks and herds. Many other people went up with them, as well as large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. And in chapter 34, not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So um, even, even restrictions on the flocks and herds. So they had plenty of animals to go. Okay, verse... This is chapter 9, verse 7 and following. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. Yet his heart was unyielding and he would not let the people go. And this raises an interesting question. Why did Pharaoh investigate this? Well, he had been told, I will not harm any of the animals of the Israelites. And so, yeah, he wanted to go find out if that was true. Um, and besides that, what did he learn? Besides the bare fact? The power of God. Yeah, say it again. The power, the power of God. Because how else would that be possible if God had not sort of put up that invisible shield around the animals of Israel unless it had been God's power because through if you, if you imagine the Nile Delta and all of the different you know divisions of the river from section to section the animals all died and yet at that one section way over on the right Goshen they did not so something happened over there God took care of those people 
All right, are you ready for a one minute discussion? I will let anybody ask or say anything about this. How was God glorified by this plague on the innocent poor critters? They don't have souls. What is the primary purpose of the animals? Man. Say it again. To be used by man. To be used to service man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man is, if you see it in the order of creation, that man is the crown of creation. The animals are put on earth right before him to give him the things that he needs. Um, to give him keeping count so you don't have to. But yeah, now maybe, maybe you have hash marks somewhere on your sheet, but uh, four times. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.